Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Pam. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're gonna wait one more minute while people flood in uh, before we get started. First, the speaker, the mic. Testing. And boy, this virtual background is so annoying to me that I am going to uh, take it off. <laughs> Welcome to my home office. So good morning and welcome. Um, I'm Pam Clark Reidenbach. I'm the executive director of the Northern Illinois Center for Nonprofit Excellence, known as NICNI. We are grateful for the partnership with the United Way of Northwest Illinois and United Way of Rock River Valley, providing funds through the State Healing Illinois Initiative, making it possible to offer this free diversity, equity, and inclusion training for nonprofit staff, board members, and volunteers. As you know, today's session is one of four to educate us on DEI and move us closer to building a culture where we all belong. We are so excited to have, been, to have sold out. We have 50, 500 people registered and a waiting list of individuals that will receive recordings. Clearly, we have turned a corner on recognizing the critical nature of inclusion and belonging in our organizations and community. There is much more work to be done, but it is a critical first step. For those of you interested in learning how to conduct courageous co uh, conversations around racial equity in your organizations or in your neighborhoods, affiliations, or dinner tables, please go to the NICNI website and register for free courageous conversation facilitation training. Along with the facilitation training session, uh, you'll be invited to participate in a courageous conversation community of practice to share best practices and learn from your peers. This training will fill up soon, so please register today. So let's get started. It is truly an honor and a privilege to introduce our presenter for today. Tracy O'Neill Ellis is a Chicago area based attorney, an HR executive and frequent speaker on race, law, politics, equity, and radically inclusive leadership. I love that Tracy. <laughs> she is also a fierce advocate for social justice. She earned her Bachelor of Science degree from the School of Business and Industry at Florida A&M University and a Juris Doctor degree from The Ohio State University College of Law. Tracy is licensed to practice law in Georgia, Georgia and Illinois. Please help me give a warm welcome to Tracy O'Neill Ellis. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am so very happy um, to be here with you this morning. Let me uh, start sharing my screen just so that we really happy to be here with you this morning and um, glad that you took time out of your busy day to come and hear about equity mindedness. But what I really wanna start off with to set the stage is that this is not a keynote speech. This is not a keynote speech. I wanna say that again. This is, I'd like to think of it, even though there are um, potentially hundreds of us in this room, on this call today, on this, in this Zoom room, that this is a conversation, this is interactive. So I want you to feel free to um, use the chat and um, we're gonna be monitoring the chat. And while I'm talking, uh, 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 Billy and Paula will be calling out, interrupting me as I've invited them to do. Please interrupt me if there are questions that I need to answer or comments that um, we need to stop and unpack. So feel free to use the chat and I thank you in advance for that. Um, I'm sorry. So whenever I, 
uh, either do keynotes or workshops around DEI topics, I always start with several agreements. And I wanna walk through, spend a few minutes walking through these agreements. So the, the first four on the left are from Glenn Singleton's Courageous Conversations about race work and his framework. And so the first one is to stay engaged. A lot of times, um, you know, we let ourselves wander, particularly if we are feeling any kind of way about the topic or in disagreement or concerned about what's being said or bored or just uninterested. But I'm assuming that you all are interested because you signed up. This is not um, like in our organizations where we have mandatory training and you must be there or else. So I want you to stay engaged and, and really work to listen and hear and, and, and follow the chat and, and challenge me and ask questions, but stay engaged with us today. Speak your truth. When you have something to say, your perspective, your feelings, your opinions matter. And so when you have something to say, don't hide, don't, don't couch it, don't think that you're going to offend me. Um, I want you to speak your truth. I want you to ask the hard questions. I want you to be real and authentic. And I hope you'll allow me to, to do the same. The third one is around experiencing discomfort. And, and a couple of times um, I've gotten negative feedback about that one. Like, why would you invite people into something and expect them to feel discomfort. And I think the reason for that is that it's in those, when we're out of our proverbial comfort zones, that's where growth can happen. That's where we can begin to challenge um, our own opinions and long held assumptions and, and be more reflective in those moments where we're feeling experiencing discomfort and asking ourselves, why are we feeling this way? So to the extent that you're feeling any discomfort, I hope you'll honor that and, and be willing to sit with that. And then expect and accept non-closure. So I don't have the, the magic bullet or the silver wand to wave over everyone and, um, and, and make the world or our organizations fully equitable and to make each of us um, expert equity-minded practitioners, right? But I hope to leave you with things to think about and uh, nuggets of wisdom that you can take back to your organizations that you can um, reflect on for yourself personally. And, um, um, but know that, that there won't be closure on a lot of these issues. And then we wanna balance showing up as experts and as learners, as experts and as learners. So at any given time, we can, including myself, can be moving from the expert to the learner. If I'm engaging with you and you're sharing your experiences and whatnot, I'm not the expert in your lived experiences. I now am learning and listening to you. So we wanna balance that and make it um, uh, a welcoming space for us to be both experts and learners. And then I wanna talk about a safe space versus a brave space. And it, it's it's a little nuanced and, and but a lot of times I used to say, you know, this is a safe space. This is a safe space. But I don't know what might make someone feel unsafe because we all have our different points of tolerance and different points of, of where we can, you know, when we stop feeling safe. There could be something I say that makes you think, I, I don't want to be in this room anymore. But what I, so I can't promise you that you'll absolutely feel safe because I don't know you and we haven't talked about that. But what, I, what I'm striving to do is create a brave space where we can be brave and courageous this morning around the, the discomfort, around speaking our truth, around sharing our perspectives. And so I try to, I, I'm trying to create a brave space and I hope you'll join me in that. Um, this, the devil doesn't need any more advocates. So <laughs> I don't know if I need to unpack that one. This is a brave space. We want you to speak your truth. I want to hear your opinions and whatnot, but we don't want to argue with each other. We don't want to argue because that shuts down conversation. That shuts down growth. We don't want to be just, um, 
Um, we don't want to, because generally when you say, well, I'm going to play the devil's advocate, it really is to, to it's coming from less than a, 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 a genuine place, okay? And then allow for growth and evolution and understanding. We're all in different places on this equity journey. Some of us are just stepping onto it. Others of us have been on this trail for a long time. But no matter where we are, we have to give each other grace. That's really what the, allow, the bottom one is about, is extending grace to each other and leading with assuming positive intent, okay? I'm going to, uh, so you heard that I'm an attorney. And so um, I'm gonna assume since no one came off mute and said, no, I don't agree. I'm gonna assume that we have an oral agreement this morning. And despite what you may have heard under certain conditions, oral agreements are valid. And um, uh, uh, one of them is that if the agreement can be performed in less than a year, that's one of them. So since we're only gonna be here a couple of hours, we definitely can wrap up this agreement in less than a year. And I'm just gonna declare, I'm gonna declare that we have entered into an oral agreement around these things and that you're with me, all right? Before we jump in, though, um, I want to. Rhonda McGee is a law professor at, at you know, one of the law schools in California, San Bernardino. San, I'm not sure, but anyway, she wrote this book. Um, she's a law professor, but her research and her work centers around racial justice and the law, and she wrote a book called "The Inner Work of Racial Justice," and she's well known for blending justice and mindfulness. And so her work tells us that in the midst of facing and talking about racial and other inequities, staying present and aware of how we are feeling is really important in reducing anxiety. So there are times when the best way to handle strong emotion is to give yourself a timeout and to give yourself space to figure out the best way to address a difficult situation. And Rhonda McGee teaches us that sitting and breathing and noticing what's arising allows us to stay present to our own racing hearts and fluttering stomachs without investing in that anxiety. So acknowledging our fears, our discomforts, perhaps anger without, without being overcome by what can be strong emotions is important if you're gonna really take a journey into equity work. So before delving into a deep conversation about bias and race and racism and equity and equity mindedness, I wanna just take a moment to let you know, as I said, I wanna reiterate that I'm grateful that you're here, that, I'm, I, that your perspective is important, your feelings are valid and your presence here today is welcome in this room, in, in this space. I also want to name and I want to honor the fact that being here may bring up some emotions, some strong emotions, maybe at times of fear or discomfort or uncertainty or anxiety. And so I want to engage, I, I always try to engage first in a mindfulness exercise. And you can close your eyes or keep them open. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter, I'm going to, um, I'm going to keep mine open, but, but uh, I'm going to do this along with you. Um, we're all busy people who cleared our calendars to be here today, so let's clear our hearts and heads and mind as well. So if we can just take a moment. I just want us to be still and just breathe deeply. Relax your body. Let those shoulders fall. Release that tenseness. Let the shoulders drop. Breathe in. Hold it for a few seconds. Now breathe out slowly, letting all of any tenseness, anxiety fall away. Ask yourself this question. How am I doing right now in this moment? Just breathe in, slowly exhale. How am I doing right now 
in this moment. While answering this, focus on the feelings and thoughts and sensations you have and give them a name. Nervous, concerned, anxious, curious, what are you feeling? Give it a name. Be aware of your breathing, your posture, how you're sitting. Are you comfortable? Have you released tension? Have you dropped those shoulders? Is your mind wandering, wandering to kids? family, work, that ever-growing to-do list. Removing those thoughts that interfere with being present, fully present right now can be challenging, but just focus on how you're doing right now. If other thoughts come in, let them in. Just don't keep them. Think them and let them pass on. Take one more deep breath, hold it, and exhale. All right, thank you for that. Let's get started. So I hope this isn't a shock to you, but you're biased. You're biased, and so am I, and that matters. It matters. And everyone has biases. It is a part of the human condition. And in fact, we are absolutely taught to have biases. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. It's important to not be ashamed of that fact, to own it. We all have biases. Bias thoughts pop into our heads a million times a day, certainly across the course of a week or a month. We have them. So I want to step back and just do a, a quick primer on bias. I'm sure that many of you have been to any number of implicit or unconscious bias workshops and whatnot, but I want to, you know, kind of make sure we're all on the same page and that we understand what it is that we're talking about when I refer to bias. Whoops, I'm gonna go back. That was an accident. So explicit or conscious bias, we know that when we see it or we hear it. Women are too emotional to be leaders. Black men are dangerous. Jewish people are greedy. Muslims are terrorists. Black people are lazy. Lazy. Asians can't fail. They're smart. It's genetically impossible for them to fail in school, right? What else is an explicit conscious bias? My grandfather, my mother's father, um, used to tell me after I became an attorney, I remember going to my grandparents' house after I had passed the bar exam and they lived in Southern Illinois and I was so excited. You know, I graduated from law school, passed the bar exam, went to their house and I walked in and came through the back door. My grandfather was sitting there at the kitchen counter and I said, um, his name was Henderson and I, we, all the grandkids call him Papa, Papa Henderson. So I said, Papa Henderson, I'm a lawyer now, I passed the bar. And he looked at me and said, I would never hire a woman as my attorney. When I hire an attorney, I want some, when I hire an attorney, I want someone who will pound the table and uh, get mad, not cry when the other side attacks. I was so taken back by that. I was so taken back by that. But that was my grandfather and that was one of many explicit conscious biases that he had. So if you think about, I'm sure across your family, your work environment, your own lived experiences and whatnot, you've heard and seen conscious bias. Implicit though, an unconscious bias um, arguably is, is more dangerous. It refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that impact how we see the world, how we understand, how we make decisions, but all on an unconscious manner. Unlike explicit or conscious bias where I can see you coming, I hear how you feel about me, I hear you, Papa Henderson, that you don't think women 
make good lawyers, just wholesale conscious bias. And now I, I know how to navigate you. But when you act in ways that are harmful on an unconscious level where you don't even recognize it, it's that mental process that have, that causes you to have negative feelings about people based on race or ethnicity or age or appearance or any number of other ways that we diminish each other. Um, that's harder to see, it's harder to re resolve, okay? And what we know is that our unconscious biases are rooted in the recognition that the human brain evolved to help the species survive. Without our brain's ability to subconsciously process thousands of pieces of information in an instant, our ancestors would have ended up as food, basically. The same ability now gets us through the day without having to slowly process every decision that we make. Science tells us that we receive 11 billion bits, 11 billion bits of information every moment, but we can only consciously process 40 bits, not 40 million bits, 40 bits, 40. So we, we receive 11 billion bits of information every moment. We can only process 40 of those 11 billion. So our conscious mind then is processing only a minute fraction of what our conscious mind, unconscious mind, our conscious mind, I wanna uh, untangle that. Our conscious mind is processing only a minute fraction of what our unconscious mind is processing. So that means, according to scientists um, and mathematicians, because I'm not one, that 99.999996% of that information is processed unconsciously. We're unaware of it. So think about that. Just think about that. Now, unconscious bias, which is what I want to focus on for a quick second, implicit or unconscious bias refers to, again, the stereotypes, both negative and positive, that exist in our subconscious and affect our behavior. Right? They exist in our subconscious and affect our behavior. And there are several kinds. Over 180 biases have been discovered. So it's deep. I want to just focus on a couple. Affinity bias. That's relatability. People who are like me and make me comfortable. People who are like me and make me comfortable. When we find people who are like us and make that makes us more comfortable, we exhale. The mindfulness that we did before about releasing tension and relaxing your shoulders, it naturally happens when we relate to people. Confirmation bias, it proves what we think we already know. So when you hear a statistic like, mm, sixty, seventy percent of the prison population is made up of Black and Latino men, subconsciously, that may confirm for some people what they think they already know. Well, of course, because Black and Latino men are engaged in more criminal behavior. That's what we think we know. That's what some people think they know. So when they hear that statistic, it doesn't shock them. It confirms what they think they know. The halo effect. You find one good thing in someone and become in awe of it. I've seen this in interviews before where a candidate is really not that great, but the candidate has one good aspect of them and people have latched onto that and forgotten that they bombed the other, you know, 12 questions because they were a rock star on this one. The horn effect, that's the flip side, hung up on one bad thing. We find out something about someone and we are hung up 
subconsciously on that one thing. And without realizing we're making all kinds of judgments about that person. Research has shown that, that people who are overweight are discriminated against in the hiring process. So no matter how good someone is, some people could be hung up on that one physical attribute. Research shows that black people with college degrees and clean criminal records have a harder time getting hired than a white person with a high school diploma and a criminal record. So we're hung up on something and subconsciously make hiring decisions based on that, okay? All right, I wanna spend a quick second talking about the um, root cause of, of um, bias. And it is what uh, social scientists have called the root cause, uh, I'm sorry, the cycle of socialization. Dr. Freeman Hrabowski states that implicit biases, favorable or unfavorable, those conscious or unconscious, horn effect or halo effect are developed over a lifetime beginning in childhood. And when examined and unaddressed, they lead to disparities across society, in healthcare, in criminal justice, in economic opportunity and more. And the cycle of so socialization depicts that. And this is a very busy cycle here. And so I'm gonna break it down um, over the next couple of slides rather than um, have you here trying to decipher this one. But I just wanted to, so that you have the visual that it is a cycle. So we're all born into a system that is already Fixed. It already has mechanics in place. We are born into it. We have no blame, no guilt, no consciousness, no awareness, no choice, no information. We're just born into it, right? And as we grow, we have limited. I'm thinking right now what's coming up for me is my three-year-old grandson. I have an eight-year-old grandson and a three-year-old grandson. And so my three-year-old grandson, even to a, a certain degree, my eight-year-old as well, because he's only eight, but that three-year-old, he had no information three years ago. Now he has limited information and a lot of misinformation about how he thinks the world works. All right. Based on how, where he is in his stage of life, but also because he's being socialized. We are taught, when I talk about being socialized, we are taught on a personal level by parents, relatives, teachers, the people who raise us, those we love and trust. Our families of origin and our friends and the places, we, um, the places where we socialize, they are shapers of our expectations and our norms, our values, our roles. They are models of ways to be and interpret the world. Because remember, we're processing, we, we're receiving 11 billion bits of information every moment, but our mind, our conscious mind can only process 40 of those bits. So a lot of how, what we learn and how we don't sit and think about every single fact or every single piece of information that comes into our mind we react and we go about our lives and we show up based on how our expectations and norms and values and roles and ways of being were modeled for us and taught to us. So my eight-year-old and my three-year-old grandsons are being shaped by my son and their mom and, and their relatives, me. I'm impacting and shaping their expectations and values. My eight-year-old grandson is in third grade He's, he's in third grade and he's in dual language. So he spends about 70 or 80% of his day being talked to in Spanish, okay? And so his norms, his values, his ways of knowing how uh, the people who are modeling ways of being and interpreting, helping him interpret all this information are impacting him, how he is socialized and what he is learning about the world. Then as we grow, the ways that we are being socialized 
from an early age, from the moment we are born, are reinforced. We are bombarded in those 11 billion bits of information with, from with messages from institutions. The places where we worship have a message and they tell us things about how to interpret the world and what to believe in and our values and those types of things, including myself. I have a place of worship and I'm influenced absolutely from a young age around my, my spiritual beliefs and, and, and what I'm grounded in and where my values come from. Our schools, again, that I just talked about. TV shapes. We're bombarded with messaging from TV about how the world works. Wrong most of the time, but nonetheless, it's, it, we're being taught that and shaped. The legal system, our mental health system, the healthcare system, the um, capitalist system, businesses. And then we're also bombarded with messages from culture, practices, lyrics of songs, language, media, our patterns of thought, our customs, our traditions, how our families do things, how our neighborhoods do things, how our schools do things, how this community does things, how this country does things. Leave this country, go to the other side of the world and find out how very differently their standards are and their culture is. These things are, these messages are bombarding us on both the conscious and the unconscious levels. And all of this then results in, I'm being socialized one way, you may be being socialized another way, and we're interacting. We come into school together, we come into the workplace together, we're out at the restaurant together, we're constantly bumping into each other with all of all that we know or think we know about how the world works and what truth is and who what experience looks like and how you do something and how you should perceive something and how you should behave in a certain circumstance and this is right and that is wrong and this is truth and that is not truth and i'm not saying that there are no absolute truths and i'm not saying that there are no absolute rights and wrongs i am just saying that we all are socialized and shaped in different ways. And then we come together and boom, there's cognitive dissonance. Sometimes we react in silence because we just withdraw. Like, I don't understand what just happened in this room. I don't understand why she's behaving that way. I don't understand why he's being aggressive my brother is also an attorney and he's six, two, six, three, um, and was, um, he's lost some weight in the, in, over the past few years, you know, working really hard, but he was about 200, he's about six, three and about 240 pounds at one time. He's about 190, 200 now, but he's a big guy. And he has been told multiple times that he's aggressive. Well, and that can be even just sitting at work in a meeting. And he's like, what do you mean I'm aggressive? I'm sitting here engaging in a conversation just like you all are. We're in this meeting, we're talking. I'm, I'm not being aggressive, but he's a big black guy. And one of his white colleagues told him, hey, Ron, you're a big black guy. When you show up, people are intimidated. And what he's asking is, is that my problem? Am I intimidating or are people just intimidated? I just show up in a room and start talking and participating and this is happening. So again, nobody would say, oh, I'm racist and I don't like Ron because he's black. But subconsciously, because that may not be true, but subconsciously there may be something going on there because you may have been socialized around from the media and from your family and from other messaging that we get, black men are dangerous. That's just one example of, of many, okay? All these biases then, they're barriers to equity. They are absolute barriers to equity. Generations of socialization, hard wires, bias into people who then create systems that have bias and inequities hardwired into them because we bring our biased selves to what we do, all right? So biased people have their biases hardwired and then we go out and work and create things and build nonprofits and build um, educational institutions. And by build, I don't mean the physical, I mean just the labor of growing and working in 
um, and bringing our talents to it. We bring our biases that are hardwired in us and then we hardwire them into these systems that are created. And then over time, these systems then become separate from us and they operate independent of how people feel or what they believe. People may not feel that men may not feel that they have any bias against women for being women, just based on gender. They may not feel that, but the systems in this country absolutely confirm that there is gender bias and that the patriarchy is active. And that is independent of how anybody feels on any given day. Because this bias is hardwired in and we're socialized to normalize it, we are socialized to normalize bias, we don't recognize it in the systems that we're all familiar with. It's normalized. So let's look at some inequitable systems. I wanna give you some, um, some data from these systems. Um, the education system, case study. Black preschoolers are 3.6 times more likely to be suspended than white preschoolers. Black students are half as likely to be assigned to gifted programs, even when they have comparably high test scores. Black kids are seen as less than, not as capable as white children. Criminal justice system. Black men are six times more likely to be incarcerated than white men. 46% are incarcerated of those incarcerated, not 46% of black men, but 46% of black men who are incarcerated are incarcerated for drug offenses. Yet black and white Americans use drugs at the same rate. And black people only make up 13, black men and women only make up 13% of the population of the US population. Let's look at wealth, a typical white family has 16 times the wealth of a black family. And research shows that it will take, if everything stayed static right now, if white people's wealth stopped, just they kept what they had, but it did not continue to grow. Fixed your wealth right now at a point in time, this point in time. It will take 228 years for black families to accumulate the same amount of wealth. Now hear me out. These are research studies, right? Over lots of people. This may not be your person. You may be saying, what are you talking about? My house is in foreclosure. I'm about to be evicted or my spouse lost the job or I was unemployed for two years before I got this job. And you know, I only have $200 in the bank. I personally don't have any wealth. I'm talking the collective. what is happening in this society. How does that wealth disparity impact a lot of the social causes that your nonprofits are contending with, right? Let's look at employment. Research shows that black applicants without criminal re records fared just under, and in some cases just as well as in getting hired as white applicants with criminal records. Black Americans are twice as likely to be unemployed as white Americans. Housing, the rate of home ownership for white Americans is 73% and for black Americans is 45%. Okay. These are just some examples. Some examples, one more. Everybody who's anybody who's applied for a job knows, you know, the stress of trying to craft the perfect resume um, that helps you land that interview, right? And have you ever thought about though how bias plays a role in the selection process of who even gets an interview? So a recent study at Yale revealed that the name of the applicant impacts the recruiting decision, while two versions of the same resume. They were identical, except for the candidate's first name were given to recruiters. The male candidate was regarded in 
uh, rubrics, you know, scoring the, the resume, the male candidate was regarded as more experienced and gifted, as well as more likely to get hired and given a higher salary. That is implicit sexism and leads to um, disparities, economic disparities, even if we are not aware of it. These resumes were the exact same and one had a male name on it and one had a female name on it, first name, and they were scored differently. And then, yes, I would hire this person after interviewing and then looking at salaries, right? Higher salary. Aside from the gender bias, racial discrimination that I, I've also spoken about is, is still another issue. There's another study that found that job applicants with names that are less white sounding are likely also likely to um, less likely to get a response from recruiters. Names that are less white sounding are less likely to get a response from recruiters. A different study took essays for college and grad school entrance and replaced real names with fake names and found that the essays written by students with white sounding names scored much higher than the essays they thought were written by students with black sounding names. Why is Sarah more employable than Lakeisha? Why is Tom getting better grades than DeAndre? Think about that. All right, so let's keep up. Oh, we look at health inequities. Why are Black people dying at higher rates from COVID-19? Because that is what the data is showing us. There are underlying health issues of hypertension, diabetes, high blood pressure. That's all that affects 40% of black men and women and develops earlier in the lives of black people, usually with more severe effects. Coronary heart disease is a major killer across all racial groups. But a large body of literature suggests that racism in all of its various forms, interpersonal, institutional, structural, disproportionately undermines the health of African Americans in the United States. So a lot of people say, well, black people are dying because of your lifestyle, black, you know, our lifestyles. We, we eat bad and we don't take care of ourselves and we've got high blood pressure from our poor eating and whatnot. But research doesn't support that. Multiple scholars, scholars argue that racism becomes embodied over the life course, negatively affecting the health of African Americans through multiple pathways, like disproportionate exposure to environmental toxins from the neighborhoods that Black people often can afford to live in, as well as economic and social deprivation. Research shows that Black people are disproportionately poor. Therefore, they disproportionately lack access to quality health care. Therefore, they're disproportionately at risk for untreated or undertreated chronic illnesses, making them then a, at higher risk for COVID-19 and more severe forms of the vi virus due to these underlying conditions. Okay. There's a concept called so, sojourn, Sojourner's Syndrome. And according to um, peer-reviewed solid research, historically, um, African-American women are particular, particularly vulnerable to the impacts of race-related stress, given their socially constructed identities as African-Americans and as women. These findings are consistent with the hypothesis that racial discrimination is a chronic stressor that can negatively impact the cardiovascular health of African-Americans through pathogenic processes associated with serious negative reactive changes in blood pressure and heart rate. Biases lead to inequities. So remember when I talked about a few minutes ago and I said we have these biases hardwired into us and then we show up and create systems with bias hardwired into them? When you look at this,
What does this chart say about how our systems work? How our institutions in this country work? Whose perspectives are centered and prioritized? Whose perspectives, whose voice is missing? There are more though that aren't on this slide. People who directed the top 100, uh, the 100 top grossing films of all time worldwide, 95% white. Teachers are 82% white. Full-time college professors, 84% white. Owners of men's professional football teams, 84% white. As Dr. Robin DiAngelo, who authored White Fragility pointed out, these are not minor organizations. These systems are some of the most powerful in this country. And these numbers are not a matter of good people versus bad people. They represent power and control by a racial group that is in a position to disseminate and protect its own, disseminate information and protect its own, in protection of its own self-image worldview and interests across an entire society. And this powerful group sets the standard for what's normal. Everything else then is abnormal or other, or has to, another way of saying it, get in where they fit in. One more recent stat I've seen says that nearly 90% of all nonprofit executive directors or presidents are white. When you think about that. So answer this question, you know, just a few words and I'm gonna ask um, for help here with the chat, but you can just put your, your answers in the chat. How does this one dimension of systemic inequity create problems for your nonprofit? This is just one racial inequity, it's just one dimension of inequity, systemic inequity, but how does this particular systemic inequity create problems for your nonprofit, for your clients, for your funding, your social impact, or any other impact that you, you wanna discuss? How does racial inequity create problems for your nonprofit, your clients, the participants in your program? how your resources are allocated, your social impact. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that I can um, see. <laughs> Not everyone feels like they belong, let's see. Someone said this is 2021 and disheartening. I agree. Lack of real understanding of the needs of clients. People's lived experiences are not at the table. Lack of information and ability to relate. The people leading do not look like the people supported. We don't reach or advocate for far too many people. Many people at our organization cannot even realize after seeing evidence that there are differences for people who are not white, strable, straight, strable. <laughs> There's a new straight, able-bodied, male, not being seen, heard, valued. People are uncomfortable with people who don't look like them or dress like them or talk like them. I, um, some years ago, I attend a predominantly um, Black church. And when I say predominantly, I mean 99% plus, maybe. And several years ago, a, um, I invited a white friend to church with me, to meet me at church. And she came. And we had been having, I mean, this was, uh, wasn't, the invitation wasn't clearly out, wasn't totally out of the blue. Um, we had been having a lot of conversations about race 
and my sharing our perspectives and whatnot. And so, um, and she attended a predominantly white church and I had been to her church before, but she had never been to mine. And so I invited her to come. And afterwards we went out to lunch and she said, can I be honest with you? And I was like, please. She said, I have never been more uncomfortable in my entire life. And I said, teeny weeny of playing the devil's advocate, even though I just said at the beginning, the devil doesn't need any more advocates. Really? Why would you be uncomfortable? What would, what, what, what happened? Was someone mean to you? Was someone rude? Did I miss something? She was like, no, it's just that nobody, uh, I, it's the first time I've ever been the only white person and it was so loud and it felt, it felt, it was nerve. I was nervous. Um, so we talked about like her church service where you come in, you sit down, there's some music, the minister preaches, nobody says anything, you're quiet, totally silent. And in my church where the music is loud, the singing is different, the music is different, the preaching is different. And while <laughs> there's a comedian, a white comedian who's married to a black woman, I can't think of his name now. He does a whole, a whole comic skit around this that he went to his wife's church and he's like, you know, the preacher, preacher said something and somebody said, amen, pastor. And he's like, shh, shh, it's rude. You know, so <laughs> the differences, the cultural differences in how we worship was, you know, I'm overstating it and being a little facetious, but she was traumatized by it. Like, oh, what is going on here, right? That's how it feels, but what I told her, that's how it feels for me every day, where I'm frequently the only one in the room or one of very few in the room. That's my life every day. So that could be your clients' lives every day. If they're interacting, potentially, if they're interacting with your nonprofit. And how does that shape their perspectives, your perspectives, how you deal with them, how, you know, what programs you're offering? How are you meeting their needs? Have you asked them? Are they at the table? Do they have a voice? Is their perspective? When you're sitting around in your meetings and you're making determinations on, on, on how to allocate resources and what programming's, programming is getting what funding, whose voice is at the table and whose voice and perspective is being centered and whose voice is missing. Okay. All right, let me, um, let me see one more. Educators are all white, so children of color don't see themselves in that role perpetuates a lack of interest in outdoor slash environmental education by people of color. Yeah, did y'all know that there's um, truth? There is, on a macro level, research shows that, that Black people have an inherent fear of being alone in nature. And when I read that a few years ago, I thought, yeah, that's me. Being alone in nature, being alone um, outdoors where it's just me, there's an inherent fear and there's a historical reason that we're not gonna unpack that right now, but if you think hard enough, you probably can, can, um, can um, get to what that is. All right, so thank you for um, your comments. I very much appreciate that. Let's go back. Let me share my screen and let us pick up. Okay. So we've got these inequities, these systemic inequities that are hardwired into our institute in the institutions because our biases are hardwired in and these institutions, you know, act independent of us, but certainly we show up then with all of our biases and we keep perpetuating inequities. So how do we start to understand what equity and inclusion looks like. So let's talk about equity a little bit. And there are, there are 
any number of, of, of definitions of equity. And I'm going to share a few that, that I like. And I don't, I think it's impossible to come down to one exact definition that, that is right and all truth for every situation, every organization, for every time. Right. I think a lot, a lot of times equity has to be contextualized for your organization because your inequities have to be dealt with. And your inequities, the inequities that are at your, your organization may be different than the inequities that are at my organization. So then what does equity look like for us could be different, but we've got some, some high level guiding principles or definitions, if you will. So guaranteeing this, this, that people are getting treated fairly and they have access and opportunity and advancement for all. And this in your nonprofits, let me be clear, this is not just for your program your, your end users, your clients, your members, your participants, the communities that you're serving. This is for you all in your organizations as well. Is there opportunity and access and fair treatment and advancement for people in your organization? So it's guaranteeing that while at the same time striving, being really intentional about identifying and eliminating the barriers that have prevented the full participation of some groups. And I wanna be also clear, let me, let me make a point that equity work is not individual work. Kind of just like I see, you know, dealing with racism is not individual, it, it, well, it is individual work, right? So if I have a racist neighbor or a racist coworker that I have to deal with, then on an individual le level, then I gotta deal with that, right? But what I'm talking about for us in our organizations, I'm talking about systemic work. How do we begin to do this systemic work. And I am a firm believer that before you can engage in systemic work, you've got to do some interpersonal work. And so if you haven't been doing interpersonal work around um, your, your biases, around racism in this country, around uh, gender bias, around um, um, homophobia, if you haven't been doing personal work around that, then, then you aren't going to be able to do systemic work. Okay. But Assuming that you all are here and you, you, you volunteered to come and learn about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm assuming that you are on a journey for your personal work. So now you're, I'm going to be talking about systemic work, right? So and then inclusion is creating this environment where everyone can feel welcomed and respected and supported and valued and have the ability to fully participate. And I also am a firm believer that you cannot, we spend a lot of time on DNI. We know that diversity is just the numerical representation and inclusion is creating this welcoming and supported and valued and, and um, respected environment. But I'm a firm believer that you cannot have an inclusive organization, an inclusive culture, an inclusive environment on top of an inequitable organization. Equity is the foundation. And if your foundation is cracked, you can't build inclusion on top of inequities, all right? This is my favorite definition. It's used in educational circles, but it really, um, it, it transcends education. So let's just take out education. When policies, practices, interactions, and resources are representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all people such that each individual has access to, can participate in, it should say, and make progress in high quality experiences that empower them towards self-determination and reduces disparities in outcomes regardless of, of individual characteristics and cultural identities. So let's look at that again. When policies, practices, interactions, and resources are representative of, constructed by, and responsive to all people such that each individual has access to, can participate in, and make progress in high quality experiences that empower them towards self-determination and reduce disparities and outcomes regardless of individual characteristics and cultural identities. How might that definition change or influence if it were active and in practice? How might that definition change or influence operations in your organizations? Just think about that.
another way to look at equity. Again, we're talking about access. Do all members of the community, of your communities, I mean your nonprofit community, your organization, the employees in there, the clients you serve, the members, the communities you're serving, do ever, does everyone have entrance into the space and involvement? And I don't mean the physical space, certainly that if, if that's appropriate, but beyond the physical space, does everybody have entrance into an involvement with and full participation in the resources and conversations and initiatives and choices which are attentive to culture and community practices? Is there representation? Does your nonprofit provide and have adequate presence of all when decision making is happening? As you examine the patterns of underlying beliefs and practices and policies and structures and norms that may marginalize specific groups and limit opportunity. Is there meaningful participation? Do people have agency and voice? Is that afforded to all the members of your nonprofit community by intentionally centering members who have been historically marginalized, including, but not limited to, people living in under-resourced communities people with disabilities, as well as racially, ethnically, and linguistically diverse people? Are you pursuing uh, multiple perspectives and valuing that? When you're looking at data and you're in the room looking at, you know, the, the efficacy of your programming and the participation rates and and um, penetration, all the, whatever the KPIs, whatever the key performance indicators, whatever the data is that you pour over in your organizations, who's in the room making meaning of that data? Of that data? Whose voice is in the room? Whose voice isn't in the room? Who's not at that table making meaning of that data? And the last point about efficacy of solutions benefiting all towards self-determination and the ability to act as contributing members in a democratic society and global community. So I wonder, let me stop sharing. I wanna come back. I'd love for you to chat again. What percent, and I don't know any of you, I don't know what nonprofits you represent, so you're safe with me. I'm not going off to figure out uh, a couple hundred people in this room. So um, if you're comfortable, tell me, um, how do I want to frame this question? What percent of your organization, based on whichever one of these three definitions now I've shown you of equity, what percent of your organ what percent of your organization is operating equitably? Are you 50% of the way towards operating equitably, dealing with inequities? Are you 10% of the way? Are you there? Have you all arrived? You're nailing it? Are you 90%? What percent? 10%. Ten percent at best, five percent, ten to twenty percent, twenty-five to fifty, twenty-five percent, ten percent, twenty perhaps, five, twenty-five percent. Just started looking at this. Thank you for that. A hundred percent. Yikes! That's great. Awesome. I've never seen that number before when I've asked this question. That is awesome. Not sure. A hundred percent is a thing. More than 50%, awesome, 25%. Woohoo to Zeke, right, woohoo to Zeke. NAACP, 80%, okay, too low to count. How do you quantify that? I don't know, it, it differs by organization. I just wanted a gut check from you all. I wanna, I, show, if you'll give me some grace now, um, and you, this person is welcome to decline because um, I don't like to put people on the spot. But if Zeke is willing, I'd love to hear what your organization is doing 
um, with equity because you're nailing it apparently. And I, I would love to share that if Zeke is willing and then you can just unmute and, and, and uh, in, interrupt if you are and stay muted if you don't want to talk and that is perfectly fine. You're welcome to do that. Um, 5%. Selfless communities need to educate families and individuals on how to welcome individuals neighbor to neighbor first prior to inviting large populations into all inclusive programs. People are afraid and need to learn how. That's powerful. That's powerful. Just starting the real push to have uncomfortable conversations sadly is probably 10%. I assume that at the federal level, education secretaries have always been white. What is the data for school superintendents across the country? Mm -hmm. Yeah, primarily. Primarily. We have a very white leadership team and those that serve in the direct support role are primarily people of color. There's a desire to be inclusive, but equity has not truly been addressed yet. Yeah, again, I'm a firm believer. You cannot build an inclusive culture and inclusive environment on top of an inequitable organization. If I am facing inequities in your organization, how am I going to ever really feel welcome and have a sense of belonging there? I'm the only uh, like, indigenous person. Uh, I, I am the chair. Or intervene. Someone talk, trying to talk to me, trying to talk to the group. I'm sorry, it, it's breaking up. Can you try that again? Is that weak? Ah. Zeke, you're you're breaking up really badly. Can anybody else hear or? Disciple? No. Yeah, you're you're breaking up really badly. So if that gets fixed, feel free to interrupt because people are definitely wanting to hear you. But yeah, you're breaking up really bad, and we can't. Maybe if you turn your video off and just leave your mic on. Can you try that? Okay. Yeah. No, you're breaking up. I'm sorry, Zeke. Um, would love for you to put something in the chat if you can. Someone asked a question about how to avoid tokenism. Um, and then the chat moved up. I didn't see the rest of the question, how to avoid tokenism. Let me see if I can scroll back. Um, any suggestions on avoiding tokenism as we make progress? Yeah, I mean, so, as you're trying, as you're striving to identify inequities and, and become more equitable, you don't want to, well, let's see. We've got all white people in the room. Let's go invite this black employee out here. Now we're not actually, the black employee comes in, gives their perspective and shares and is patted on the head and not really seriously considered. They were not really invited into the work to have influence. Okay, I've been that token person in the room. And after, you know, after you get a little bit seasoned, you recognize it, All right? So you go find the one, you know, transgender person in your community and ask them, but you aren't allowing, if you're trying to deal with inequities around transgender people and transgender people, not just one token person, transgender people are not at the table helping you shape and influencing your thought and influencing your practices, then it's tokenism. Because if at the end of the day, when the one black person or the one female or the one transgender person or the one person with disabilities leaves the table and then you all move on like, oh yeah, okay, we heard her, we heard him, we heard them, but you move on without ever really doing any change work and involving that community in your change work, then it's tokenism. And you avoid it by being intentional and genuine and serious about seeding power 
and seeding decision making and being more inclusive about the decision making and at least who gets to speak into that data and interpret it and help shape meaning from it. Because I could look at some data with my lived experience as a black woman in America and Billy could look at data with her lived experience and we could come up with totally different perspectives about what the data is saying and what it means and what we ought to do about it, okay? All right, thank you for that. Let's keep going. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. <coughs> so you've probably seen some version of this graphic before, um, but I, it's important. It's an important graphic and it's worth continuing to look at, continuing to keep top of mind if you have seen it before, because it really is dealing with equality versus equity. So in this first image, it's assumed that everyone benefits from the same support. Like, hey, we're gonna be equal. No favoritism around here. Everybody's gonna get the same, same support. Every single one of them is being treated equal. But if you look at the, the far right in that first image, that person has the same support that the other two people have and yet is still being marginalized his needs are not being met. It's equal, but it's not equitable support. In the middle, individuals are given different support to make it possible for them to have equal access to the view. They are being treated equitably. And that is where we're striving. That's what this is about. Now, when we really get good at equity, what we wanna to move to that third frame is liberation where all three can see the view without any support because the cause, the barriers have been removed and addressed. That's liberation. That's deep systemic work. And I, I don't know, not saying that there aren't any, I, I'm saying I don't know of any that are at true liberation yet. I think there are people at the organizations at various degrees of equity and some that are still focused on equality and some that aren't even doing that. But liberation is a whole nother thing. And I hope someday that I am um, able to do a workshop on liberation, but um, I don't think we're there yet. So allocating resources, time, effort, energy, programming, directing attention in an equitable way means that supports are tailored to what people need to address the barriers that exist, okay? So this is a busy slide, I'm gonna go over this, but this is from the Equity Literacy Institute and they have um, several equity principles and it's used in the education sector, but again, it's applicable across all sectors. So when I start reading this, any place you see kids and um, any place you see kids or families, if that doesn't pertain to your nonprofit, you can substitute what does pertain, clients, members, participants, communities, employees, okay? Equity-minded principles. The direct confrontation principle. This is my favorite one. There is no path to equity. There is no path with to, there is no path to equity without direct confrontation with inequity. You have to identify it and name it and confront it and deal with it. You can't go over it, under it, around it. You can't gloss over it. That inequities are barriers to equity. And there is no path to equity without a direct, direct confrontation with inequity. So cultural and structural racism, sexism, all the isms, any other form of oppression, you have to deal with directly. Equity approaches 
Anything you're doing in the name of equity that is that fails to di directly identify and confront that inequity plays a significant role in sustaining inequity. Okay, the equity ideology. The principle there is that equity is more than just a list of practical strategies. I don't have a checklist to send to you because equity is really a lens and it is an ideological pursuit. It is a lens through which we see the world and we do our work. There are no top 10 practical strategies that will help you develop equitable institutions if you're unwilling to deepen your own understanding and our collective understandings of equity and inequity and then reject all ideologies that aren't compatible with equity. I can't give you a check. I mean, there are some, you know, best practices and or or I, that's the wrong word. I, I don't like best practices. There are some things that you can do. One is recognizing that this is not individual work. This is systemic work. So when you're dealing with um, in your nonprofits, for example, and you're dealing with young black males, maybe that's maybe you've got programming for young black males. OK. Any programming, I, I, I talked with a nonprofit a couple of years ago and it was a community college and they got uh, like a half a million dollar grant to to work with um, retention and persistence through college, you know, to get young black men from into into community college and then to be able to persist through to graduation and, and hopefully um, if they desire, or if it's appropriate, on to um, a four-year college or further education. And one of the things that they were actually allocating resources from, from this grant that I was appalled at, was taking these um, young Black males to a nice restaurant and teaching them all the forks on the table and knives and silverware and which glasses are which and how to tie ties. Now, I don't there's just so much I could say about that. Because then that makes, what is the connection between knowing which fork and knife and spoon to use and which is your water glass and which is your wine glass? What connection is that to success in community college? Because that, that was the purpose of the programming. What is the connection? What does the data say about that? Because I, I told I won't say my age, but I told you all I have an eight-year-old. And listen, I need to stop sharing the screen for a second so I can see you all. Okay, I told you all I have an eight-year-old and a three-year-old grandson, and I'm old enough to be a grandmother. Okay, I don't know necessarily which fork is right, and knife and spoon. And I'm always to the person sitting back in the old days when we used to be out at restaurants and ballrooms and gatherings and whatnot like that looking at the person on my left, is this your glass or mine? Is that your water glass or mine? I don't know, but I tell you what, I managed to get through law school. I managed to, I've managed to practice law for 30 years. I've managed to operate in the C-suite and I don't know, I'm no Emily Post follower. I don't know the rules of etiquette and whatnot. So why, why are resources being allocated to making sure young black males know which fork and knife to use when they show up in a restaurant? And what connection is that to the purpose of the programming? And why are you making all that we know about the trials and tribulations of college graduation rates for young black males, why are you making their, their knowledge of forks and knives? And in, why are you making their, their ability to persist through college and graduate about forks and knives, any part of it. That's, that's what's perplexing to me. And I wonder, are you examining those types of things in your organizations? All right, somehow sharing is stop. When I stop sharing my screen, I feel like I can make a point better when I can see you. Uh, all righty, let's go back. Prioritization principle. In order to achieve equity, we must prioritize the interest, again, 
this is for education. So, but take out students and families, insert what makes sense in your organization. In order to achieve equity, we have to prioritize the interests of those clients, those members, those participants, those employees, those communities whose interests historically have not been prioritized. Every policy, practice and program decision should be considered through the question, what impact is this going to have on the most marginalized fill in the blank, the most marginalized clients? What impact is this decision going to have on the most marginalized fill in the blank so it makes sense for you? How are we prioritizing their interests? Okay, the redistribution principle. Ooh, now this is, remember that mindfulness exercise? Breathe deep, let it out. Relax the shoulders, relax the shoulders. Redistribution principle. Equity requires the redistribution of material, cultural, and social access and opportunity. Material, resources, and money. Cultural, and social access and opportunity. And we can do this by changing inequitable policies, eliminating oppressive aspects of institutional culture and examining how practices and programs might advantage some, for my sector, students, for yours, insert the blank, might advantage some over others. If we cannot explain how our equity initiatives redistribute access and opportunity, then you've got to reconsider them. Fix injustice, not kids. Fix injustice, not fill in the blank. Whatever sector, whatever, whoever your clients and targets are for your work. Fix injustice, not kids. That goes back to my example about that, that community college that is spending grant money on teaching young black males ostensibly how to get through college by knowing which forks and knives to use. So you're trying to fix the kids, not injustices. What are you doing to use that grant money to while you're working with them to also remove barriers that are inhibiting college persistence and graduation rates. So the outcome disparities are not the result of deficiencies in marginalized communities, cultures, mindsets, grittiness, but are rather inequities. Outcome disparities, I had a, re okay. Y'all know the drill now, I'm gonna stop sharing. Outcome disparities are not the fault or the mindset, or not due to mindset. There's nothing inherently wrong with black children or black college students, black males, women, people with disabilities, people in the LG, um, LGBTQIA plus communities. Pick a marginalized community. There's nothing inherently wrong with them. Outcome disparities across an entire group are due to inequities, not individual problems. Black students don't need more grit. I promise you that the most marginalized black, black students show up with more grit by the time they're 10 than most of you in this room on this Zoom call have in a lifetime. Okay, all right, I'm going back to sharing now. One size fits few principle. No individual identity group shares a single mindset, value system, learning style or communication style. Identity specific equity frameworks, like in the education sector, group level learning styles, almost always are based on some simple notion or stereotype and not equity. So equity won't say things like black people need, what black people need or what all black people need is X. 
But what all women need is Y. What all youth need is Z. That's not equity. You have to identify the specific equities. Do all black people need that? Or do black women between the ages of 12 and 18 need that? Or between the ages of 30 and 45 need that? Or do black men need that? Or do black um, young males? Do, you, have, you have to get down to, and this is where it, 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 it becomes important that you're willing to be honest and do the hard work and face hard truths in your own organizations about what the inequities are. The evidence-informed equity principle. Equity approaches should be based on evidence for what works rather than trendiness. Evidence can mean quantitative, but it also means the stories and experiences of people who are marginalized in your institution. Um, I believe in data-informed data approaches. I really do. I think data is important and it can be instructive and it can help us in many ways. <laughs> But, so you know, I stopped sharing, so now I'm trying to really make a point. But a hyper-focus on just quantitative data, if that's where you're spending all of your time on just the quantitative data, you don't have the full picture. You have to listen and interrogate the qualitative data. You have to listen to, you have to seek out you have to listen to and you have to believe the lived experiences and the stories of the people that you purport to be serving. Because they have the data behind the data. And if you are not with a keen, a deep sense of curiosity and caring for the people that you serve, if you are not seeking out and hungry for their stories and experiences to help inform and shape your work and bring meaning to the data, you're missing equity, okay? All right. All right, so what does it mean to be equity-minded? It means that you have a willingness to look at client outcomes and disparities at all levels, disaggregated by race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status and any other um, cuts, data cuts that make sense for your sector, for your community, for who you're serving. Certainly in education, in my sector, we wanna look at it by race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status because those, those disagre that disaggregated data is very revealing. Being equity-minded means that you have a belief in the fairness of allocating additional resources to those clients, participants, community members who have greater needs due to the systemic shortcomings of our systems and providing for them, due to systemic shortcomings, not individual shortcomings, but due to systemic shortcomings. And you have a fundamental belief in the fairness of allocating additional resources. That's equitable allocation of resources, not equal allocation of resources. A recognition that individuals are not responsible for the unequal outcomes of the groups that have historically, that they're part of, that have historically experienced discrimination and marginalization in the US. I did not create, no matter what I go out here and do, no matter how I show up, good, bad, authentic, inauthentic, I am not responsible for the outcome disparities of black people in this country. I raised two sons, I am not responsible for the outcomes, the unequal outcomes of young, of young black men in this country on an individual basis. There are inherent systemic inequities that in spite of my individual efforts still operate. My sons are now 30 and 27. 
and they get pulled over, especially now the 30 year old than the 27 year old because the 27 year old cut his hair off to just change his appearance. But my 30 year old has his mother's stubbornness and he had long locks, like I have locks, but his were, you know, down mid arm and he has tattoos on his arm. He's got tattoos everywhere, but on his arm, on his legs. And so you've got this, and, and he's a, a gym buff. He likes, he loves working out. He's fixated with being in the gym and working out and, you know, building muscle mass and all of that, really into health and wellness. And so you've got this buff black guy coming at you who in the summertime might have on a um, sleeveless shirt or a short sleeve shirt and you see tattoos and you see these long dreads and he might have them pulled up. They might be down. They might, he, his are long enough to take a dread and tie it, tie his, the rest of them together. He might show up that way, but he gets pulled over disproportionately. Not given tickets, but pulled over. That is not due to any individual shortcoming in my 30 year old or in the way his father and I raised him, okay? Respect for the aspirations and struggle of your clients, participants, community members who are not well served by current systems rather than derision and judgment towards them. You have respect, genuine respect for their aspirations and struggles. You're creating a sense of belonging for them. And it's authentic because you're also dealing with inequities. I think I left out one. Recognition that the elimination of entrenched biases, stereotypes and discrimination institutional on an institutional level requires the intentional critical deconstruction of those policies and structures and practices and norms and values that we assume are race neutral, but really are not. Or pick the other oppression. We assume they're gender neutral, but they're not. Again, that one is going back to the direct confrontation principle. There's no path to equity without a direct confrontation with inequity. There is no elimination in dealing with biases and stereotypes at the institutional level without the intentional and critical deconstruction of all the structures and policies and practices and norms and our ways of being and operating that uphold those inequities, right? So I wanna stop here and ask if there are any questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. Do you have questions, comments that you wanna discuss? You can come off mute and just shout out. This is where we spend some time. My brother calls it, let's wrap and be relevant. So let's wrap and be relevant about equity. What's on your mind? Because I told you this was not a keynote. And um, I need a break from talking. I need I'll a go. Break going through. Thank you. I'll go. So about a year ago, my, uh, my, I'm just, I'm not a great driver, I will admit. And I rear-ended somebody and it was totally my fault. And oh, keep in mind, I'm, I'm a fat, loud white girl. So that, that's important. And I... You know, the police came and everything. And I was like, oh, I can't find my stuff. And he's like, that's okay. I'll just get back in my car that's behind, you know, the van the, that I was driving. And I, I thought to myself, man, would that have happened if I was black? And then I got my stuff and I got out of my car and I walked up to the police's door and rapped on his window the entire time. My internal monologue was, this would not be happening if I was black. This would not be happening if I was black. I would not be able to walk up to a cop's door and knock on their window and them not feel threatened by me. So, I mean, that's, I don't know. I point that stuff out constantly. 
especially thank to my kid. You. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I um, that's real. And so my, my 30 year old, maybe about, he was about 20, he was in his early 20s. Maybe he was 25, doesn't matter. A few years ago, several years ago, was driving from Illinois to California. And he got stopped between Illinois and California six times by the police, never got a ticket. But on two of those occasions, two of the six, one in Iowa and one in Arizona, the stop was one in Iowa, if I remember correctly, was about two hours and the one in Arizona was about four hours on the side of a highway with his car, the contents of his car tossed, trunk opened, contents taken out, bags unzipped, dumped. He had two gym bags in his back seat, unzipped, dumped. They, they popped his, tr his, his um, hood on the car and he said they took some machine and went over it. I said, you know, I assume it was scanning for drugs or traces of drugs or something. Um, and so, so his mom is a lawyer, right? And his uncle, I told you my brother's a lawyer and my, bro my brother was a prosecutor for, uh, you know, probably 15 years and then, a, and then has been a city attorney um, for the last several years. But anyway, we're constantly, you know, talking um, my ex and I raised our sons, you know, come home alive, right? That was our mantra to them. Do what the police say, but come home alive. Your mother is an attorney. If they mess up, I got you, baby. I got you, but I need you to come home alive. Cause I don't, I'm gonna get you. I mean, I got you back anyway. I don't want to bury you and then go get, go get them. I want you to come home alive. And my, when he was leaving on this trip, my brother told him, listen, don't consent to any searches because the police are known criminals <laughs> and they will plant stuff. Don't consent to any searches. So he's on the side of the highway. The police ask, can I search your car? And he says, no, sir, I don't consent to you searching my car. And so the police in, Iowa, in Arizona, the reason that became a four hour ordeal is he said, well, you either give a permission or we'll go get a warrant. And the officer, the sheriff, whoever it was, in whatever county that was, said, I'm going to go give you a few minutes to think about this. And so he tried to reach me. He tried to call me. He tried to call my brother. He couldn't reach any, either of us, but he had in his mind, don't consent to a search. So he was like, well, no, sir, I don't consent to a search. And the officer said, okay, we'll go get a warrant. So hours later, they're still sitting on the side of the road. Nobody's showing up with a warrant, nothing's going on. Now, I, I had missed several calls from him and my brother had missed calls. It was just a bad day for my kid. He couldn't get, got two free lawyers and couldn't reach either one of us. But when he finally got me, I was like, he was like, mom, I'm consenting to the search. This is ridiculous. They're, they're just not letting me go. And so I'm running down all the issues that are behind this. But ultimately, what we said is they're not getting a warrant. They're just harassing you and wearing you down. And he was worn down. And so he consented to that search. And that's when his car got tossed and, and the second time that everything got dumped out and they left it. Um, so, our experiences with the police are very different than my white friend's experiences with the police. And we have a, an inherent distrust of the police. My, my youngest son last summer, um, I was going to a, a wedding and I'm um, of a college friend and I'm driving um, in Chicago to this venue, wedding venue. And um, my ex calls and he says, hey, where are you? And I said, I'm in Chicago. He's like, where? Now I'm annoyed, right? Cause he's my ex, why are you in my business? You know, but I was like, why? Why do you wanna know? And he said, because um, Jay just called, he's pulled over on the side of the road. And my ex doesn't live, wasn't in Chicago and lives about an hour and a half away from Chicago. And so he said, you're closer, can you get there? I'm like, 
yes. And he, I, he has a work cell phone and a personal cell phone. So he was, I could hear noise on his personal cell phone. He was calling me on his work cell phone. And I said, where is he? Now he, you know, was about 20 minutes away from me in the opposite 20, 25 minutes away, but I'm trying to get there, but I can hear him arguing with the police. And I'm telling him, what is this kid doing? Tell him to stop arguing. This is Chicago police. They are a notorious gang. Like stop arguing. They'll just shoot him to shut him up. Tell him to stop arguing. My heart is racing. I'm near tears because I know that my child is pulled over on the side of the road with a Chicago police officer, a couple of Chicago police officers, and I can hear him being argumentative with them because he's telling them, give me a ticket or let me go. What is it? He was pulled over because his the license plate was expired. That's why he got pulled over. And then they asked to search his car. And he said, because he's listened to me and my brother, he said, no, I don't consent to the search of the car. So they're harassing him. Do you have drugs in the car? Why won't you let a consent? What are you, what are you hiding? All of that, all right? And I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there because you know, I'm a mama bear. And even though at that time he was 26 and he's an adult, you know, I, I've got this keen sense that my child is in trouble. Like by the time I could get there, they had let him go. And so I called him on the phone. So his dad said, yeah, he's, he's on his way. They're letting him go. So I never got to him, but I called him and I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm headed home. And I said, before you go in that house, check every inch of your car, every single inch of your car. If they were in your trunk, if they were had access into that car, you check every inch of it because the Chicago Police Department is notorious as, as our other police departments for planting drugs. Check the car. And that is just the reality of how we navigate the world, okay? And so, the idea that somehow it is some individual failing of black youth or young or black men or black women or black parents or whatever for the inequities that are in that the systemic inequities is a fallacy. And so we have to be willing to interrogate that in our in our organizations and challenge. What assumptions, how do you approach your work? What assumptions do you make? What beliefs do you have about the clients and the people you serve and how you're serving them? What are the assumptions and beliefs that you have? Um, I see this one comment here from Sharon. We older people have already lived and learned and made our mistakes, but young people need to be given the chance to make their mistakes without judgment. It takes a generous heart not to be offended by naive attitudes of our youth so we all need to learn together to be willing to listen without taking offense. Amen to that. And also, isn't that the case? Not only certain, yes, with our youth, but even with each other as adults. Can you listen to my stories of inequities? And instead of being judgmental, well, if your kid didn't have tattoos or if he just cut his locks off, which is what my younger son did, or if he would only do this, that, or the other. Can you listen to lived experiences of your clients and your communities and demonstrate empathy and have a genuine curiosity about those lived experiences and how you, how your organization is servicing them and assumptions that you're making about them? Some questions. Oh, I like this comment. I try to start out with saying to myself, my assumptions are probably wrong, stay open. How can you make individuals, this is a question, how can you make individuals feel comfortable sharing their qualitative stories when they seem reluctant to? Well, first of all, can anybody just come off chat and say, why would someone, why, why would someone be reluctant to share their stories? They'll be re-traumatized all over again by the event. Re-traumatized. Gaslighting. Gaslight, gas, oh, amen to that. Gaslighting, not believed. They're not sure of the confidence that uh, you may keep their, keep their, their trust. You may, you may violate Lack the trust. trust. Yes, that you will violate the trust and share. Mm -hmm. They get blamed. 
they get blamed, yes. That goes back to that individual, you know, you're responsible for the inequities that you face and the harm and oppression that our clients and those that we serve deal with. It's one of, so there are lots of oppression. So I'll talk about, you know, and I'm talking, relating from my lived experiences again as a black woman and I live at the intersection of race and gender, right? Um, so I'm black, I'm female. But I often say that I had a 50, 50 chance of being born a woman, but given my parentage, it was 100% certain I was gonna be black. And so the, inequities in my lived experiences, I've faced some gender discrimination before, I most definitely have, but where I've been the most harmed and oppressed has been around race. And so I rail against colorblindness because I consider it erasure. And so if you're being, so with respect to race, if you're being colorblind, but also if you're being blind and, and, and neutral to whatever the demographic is, you're missing, you're erasing potentially lived experiences. If men erase the experiences of women in this country, then they're erased. You say, I, all my white friends know, nobody, they don't say this to me. They don't, Tracy, when I look at you, I don't see color. The lies you tell. <laughs> you doggone very well do see me. If you have sight, you do see my color. What you've done is erased me to somehow try to make me palatable. You don't want to deal. I, my color being black in America informs my perspectives. It is the lens through which I see the world. It is how I navigate the world. It is how I experience the world. And so if you tell me that when I look at you, I don't see color, then what you're telling me is, hey, I don't, I want to stay blind because I don't really want to have to deal with your life and you. I don't really want to know you. I only want to know you and interact with you how I want to perceive you. And I can erase everything else. So then I can be dismissive of anything that you say to me. Are we being colorblind? Are we being gender blind? Are we being identity, name it, blind to those that we purport to serve? I don't really want to see you, right, Regina? I don't see color means I'm done thinking about those issues. My job is done. I'm no longer part of the problem. Tanner is exactly right. I don't see what oppresses you. I don't see it and therefore I don't have to deal with it. It's not my problem, it's your problem. How do you confront? What is an inequity? What would the direct confrontation principle tell you right now about an inequity that your clients face, your communities face, that your organization, not generically out there in the big old wide world, but that in your organization, if you all were going to honestly interrogate an, an inequity and name it and really begin to try to dismantle it, think of that inequity and what would the direct confrontation principle tell you that you should be doing? to begin to dismantle that. What would it look like to apply those equity principles and not fix your clients, but fix the inequities? What are you fixing? These are the questions that equity-minded practitioners are asking themselves. And even as someone who, who considers myself to be well-versed in equity and pretty far up the, the learning curve around equity, I still have to be challenged. And I still, because we're human and our biases, you know, this, my point is that you can never stop the challenging. You can never stop trying to poke holes in your own beliefs and your own thoughts and your own assumptions about what something means and what is happening. 
Courtney says, for my mom, she has said this, and I try to explain this to her, why it's an issue to say this. I think you're talking about colorblindness or I don't see color. I can see that she is saying it in a, in a way that means colorblind as in we're all just people. But she now understands that yes, we're all people, but you have to see the colorblind issue because there are issues with society and racism. Yes, we are all people, but we all don't experience have the same experiences. So sometimes I understand when people say, Tracy, when I look at you, I don't see color. I understand that you don't mean harm, but equity work is about impact, not intention. And the impact, if you cannot see my color, then you are missing my lived experiences. You will not begin to understand. What I want instead is for you to see my color and respect my humanity and my dignity. I want you to be curious about your clients, your members, your program participants, your communities. I want you to be deeply curious. Equity mindedness really is about a deep curiosity and a willingness. Remember I talked at the beginning about showing up as an expert and a learner? That's not just for this workshop. That's a principle for our work, not workshops, for our work balance being an expert and a learner, having a deep curiosity. All right, um, brings to mind the white slash blue lives matter and ignoring how this disregards the black lives matter reality. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, oh, I adopted a child of another race and now at 19, she is hypersensitive about looking different from us and her parents. And the chat, is, um, I'm learning to listen without judgment so she can talk to me and us about the thoughts and fears now. That goes, thank you for that, Sharon. And that goes back to avoiding tokenism because you're listening without judgment. You're listening to learn and not fix that person, but fix the issues. How do we call each other into this work while also calling out the inequities. That is super important. And it's a hard balance. It's a hard balance for me in doing this work and leading workshops like this, because how do I speak my truth and talk about what the research shows about inequities without leaving people feel like feeling like I called you out? And I wrestle with that just to be transparent. How do I deal with systemic inequities? How do I talk about racism? How do I talk about gender bias? And how do I say that colorblindness is offensive without leaving someone feeling attacked, feeling unheard, feeling devalued? How do I call you into this without calling you out? How do I say to you that equity is important? And if you're not dismantling equity, you're upholding inequity without you feeling like a personal attack. And I don't know, I, I, well, I, I do know, I have not mastered this. I have not mastered it. Because again, the direct confrontation principle says that there's no path to it without directly confronting but what I try to do and what you have to try to do is focus on the inequities, not the people. Right? So if I pick on Paula or Billy, I want to focus on the inequity. I'm not focused on you. I am not calling you a racist. I am not calling you. You might be, I don't know. But that's not what I'm focused on. What I'm saying is that in your nonprofit, if you are serving young black males, unless you are listening and in tune with the stories and the lived experiences of black youth and challenging your assumptions about what you think. And when I tell you, Paula, that no, young black males are not inherently criminal. No, young black men, that's not true about this. I have to 
if we're working together on this, I have to be willing to challenge you and your assumptions. And that goes back to how we have courageous conversations, particularly if we're one-on-one, -on -one, it's, it's harder, but that's why we have these agreements up front. That's why I spend time talking about the agreements before just, um, <coughs> before just jumping into um, a conversation about these hard topics. Someone, um, my boss calls race specifically, the third rail, that thing you don't touch. We all in the cities who deal with Metro and rails and tracks and whatnot, trains and what, you don't touch that third rail. That's what talking about race is like. That's what talking about injustice and social justice and social impact and telling, you know, talking about reallocating resources and a redistribution and all of those things. It's touching the third rail and it pulls on people's emotions. But I try to stay focused on the issues and not people. And I try to build trust as best I can in my organization, in the, um, with my clients, outside my regular day job, with participants in workshops. I try as best I can in the span of a couple of hours to build credibility and um, trust. And to be vulnerable, willing to be vulnerable. That's that balancing learner versus expert, willing to be vulnerable. That's all part of building trust with your clients, with your colleagues, with the communities that you serve, of calling people in rather than calling people out. Sometimes people need to be called out. So if I were, if I, my PowerPoint were showing now, this is the portion where I just wanted us to spend time talking. If my PowerPoint were showing now, this is the point where I'd stop sharing because I got to lean into the camera. Some people need to be called out, right? That's just the truth. But not everybody about everything needs to be called out. If you approach this work from a sense that I'm going to go tell her a thing or two, or I'm going to tell him a thing or two, you're going to be holding ineffective because this is not individual work, it is systemic work and it is collective work. And without the collective, so I can call you out. I can, let me pick on somebody. I see a Jennifer um, in front of me. Yep, hi Jennifer. I can call Jennifer out. She can say something that, I, that offends me and I can be like, you're racist, that was racist. And I've had to have some conversations like that, but that's not where I generally start. So if Jennifer said something that was off today or you know was a microaggression it is not going to behoove me to attack her publicly in this on this zoom i might try to use it as a teachable moment i might try to talk to her privately afterwards i might bring her something to read and say hey can we look at this together there are all kinds of ways short of calling people out and building authentic relationships so the even if jennifer and i disagree We've built trust in an authentic relationship. I respect her, she respects me. And hopefully we can keep moving forward. There's no silver bullet, there's no magic wand to being equity-minded, to bringing people into the work. People have to have a desire to come into the work. That's the other thing, leading, coming into the work with positive intention and not everybody has a desire to come into the work. And those that don't, you know, you gotta recognize and move on. You're not going to, to find fertile ground and growth between rocks, underneath rocks. So you have to look for the fertile ground and build those relationships and alliances and call those people in to the work, all right? Ah, it is 1059 and I could keep going and I have five more slides, but I think I wanted to have this conversation and a time to connect. So I'm not going to go back because I'm out of time. I just wanna say thank you very much. I appreciate your um, genuineness, your authentic, authenticity, the questions, your comments, all of that. And I'm very grateful that you came today. I hope to see you again. Thank you, Paul and Billy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. 
We will be sharing the recording out following this session. And please do complete the post-session evaluation that I dropped into the chat or that I will send an email to you. I want to share a little information about the things coming up in Nickney's land. So we have on the 19th, Tracy will be leading that courageous conversation facilitator training that Ham had mentioned at the beginning of the session. And on April the 9th, the next session for this series will happen and that's going to be focused on cultural competence. I also wanna let you know that we have a free panel discussion on the eviction moratorium left in Illinois and in the Rockford area, what the impact is going to be. So we have several panel members that are going to be speaking on that. I can send that information to you, but you, we hope that you will join us if that's relevant to your client population. And we have a training on April 30th led by Sam Castri on HR considerations under a new president. So I will send information on that for you as well. So thank you so much, everyone, today. This was fantastic. We'll see you next month. Bye-bye.